Let's break the political talk show mold. Anything worth doing is hard, and that includes being a good citizen. Our mission is to help you be that better citizen by letting you hear about stuff you might not know, which will make everyone think you're so smart, or by giving you a chance to listen to interviews and debates on a wide variety of subjects that might actually allow you to form new opinions in the privacy of your own mind. I'm Justin Oldham, and you are listening to the Politics and Patriotism Show here on the Stitcher Smart Radio Network. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another civic edition of the Politics and Patriotism Show. Over the next 40 minutes in this episode, we're going to let off some steam and shed some light on what people are calling alternative or green energy technologies. I'm going to do this by sharing with you a conversation I had with Alexis Madrigal. He's the technology editor for Atlantic Magazine, and we'll be talking about his book, called Powering the Dream. It was first published in 2011. It's been republished in 2013 by DeCapo Press. Now, I know what you're thinking, but don't be so fast to reach for that pause button because you're probably wrong. Powering the Dream is Madrigal's chronological history of what we tend to think of as alternative energy technologies, and you may be surprised to know that some of this stuff dates all the way back to the 1840s. It is that history I think you should know about because once you have this food for thought it makes it easier for you to talk this over with your friends when you're considering the future of wind and solar and tidal generators geothermal and all that other stuff that's in the news these days so settle in plug in get comfortable set your web browser to alexismadrigal.com so you can follow along with all this and get ready to learn some things you did not know about America is green energy past so you can argue more effectively for what you think we should do in our green energy future. It comes a sun I say it's all right. My name is Alexis Madrigal. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic Magazine. I'm author of Powering the Dream, The History and Promise of Green Technology. And I've been a visiting scholar at uh, Berkeley studying uh, history and energy. I am particularly interested in this book because we spend a lot of time on this show talking about the importance of civics. And I bang the drum of history quite heavily all the time because where we have been gives us a sense of where we can go. And I really think that when it comes to our energy past, we really don't know it. And I thought I knew it, but as I read this book, I bumped into people and technologies that I did not know as well as I did, and just chapter after chapter of of this brought me up to speed in ways that I wasn't aware of, and I consider myself to be a college-educated man, so clearly I need to go back to my institution of higher learning and put a few more quarters in the machine, because... What what I picked up from this tells me that as a country, we need to know more about this so we can have a better dialogue. I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, that's why what inspired me to write the book in the first place. I, I realized, you know, I went to the Library of Congress's American Memory Collection, which has, you know, not everything that's in the Library of Congress by any stretch of the imagination, but it has a good sampling. And when I typed in solar power uh, into the search box, Almost nothing came up. There's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one is that energy is traditionally both fossil and non, um, been a real boom and bust industry. And when things go bust, lots of things get lost, lots of people get forgotten. Um, we didn't have people, and we still don't really, dedicated to archiving these things in real time so that future people could go back and say, hey, what happened? And I think to your point, it's really important that we do, in fact, do that kind of accounting. A, because we want to know, you know, where were government dollars well spent, where were private dollars well spent, did technologies like, say, you know, wave motors, did they not work out for engineering reasons, for social reasons, did the financing break down, 
And I, you know, I think when we think about technology, we tend to think, you know, certain things were inevitable. Um, and I think a lot of what this book shows is that while maybe there was a, a little bit of a tilt to certain things in history and things would have tended to go certain ways, there are definite moments in time where, you know, if things had broken a different way, we'd be a lot farther in solar power, we'd be a lot farther in wind power. Um, and I think that's that's a key thing to uh, to remember that technological development has these uh, features that it doesn't it doesn't move smoothly, um, and sometimes we can't tell uh, what things are going to work out best. Well, you've put your finger on something that's I think very important, and I really want to highlight this for our audience: technological development. And I want to, with that in mind, I want to start from the very beginning and. Take us back to the 19th century. Um, we're, we're talking about a period in which oil has not been discovered yet. It's not even an idea. And yet we still have to build this new nation. And people just assume here in the 21st century that, well, it happened somehow. They just did it. But t- talk to us about the the earliest days what did they power this country with yeah, there were basically two competing models and, and you know I, in the book i sort of used lowell massachusetts which was water powered and has a bunch of features and we used pittsburgh coal and it's you know it's very smoky very sooty um and that city tended to follow more of what i'd call the kind of british model um building on coal kind of a built permanent underclass who works um in the in the factories uh ruled over by like a small number of of people who everyone's kind of that's a fixed social arrangement in Lowell, you have something really different go on. You had people, business owners, and you know members of the community there that wanted to come up with a better or distinctly American way of industrializing. I mean, something that's really important to remember is that stories about the horrors of British industrial cities. I mean, this is, you know, when you think of like Tiny Tim, people knew about Tiny Tim's. Um, they knew about uh, these kind of Dickens world of you know children in the street working long hours and just the the environmental horrors. I mean, I don't even think people would have said it quite like that, but just the air was polluted, the cities were polluted, the water was getting poisoned. And I mean, this was really having a a seriously negative impact on the physical health of uh, people in cities. And so Americans, you know, sitting out there in what's now, you know, fancy rural Connecticut, were going like, hey, I don't don't want to do that. You know, I mean, I might be a farmer, I might be relatively poor, but at least I'm not that. And so a lot of what people in Lowell, this group of New England business did was try and come up with a totally alternative model of industrialization. And so they used the naturally occurring water power, basically um, capturing the power that comes from water falling downhill, basically. And they also came up with new social arrangements too, trying to create a labor force out of young women who would kind of rotate through the factories and then go back to their families after they'd made some money. And, you know, I mean, this system is far from perfect. People work really long, brutal hours long before labor movement kind of comes along, gives people weekends and 40-hour weeks and stuff like that. But we we see the beginnings of a different kind of system. And, you know, visitors who came to America in the 19th century, you know, they would go to like New York, D.C., Boston, and Lowell. And people even, you know, within the United States, you know, uh, people coming from the South trying to figure out if they wanted the South to industrialize would go visit Lowell and see because it's kind of considered the best way that it could be done. Now, with the comparison of what Water-powered Lowell, Massachusetts, coal-fired Pittsburgh, and the radically different appearances of those, you also touch on the very different social arrangements that exist in both of those places, and that's relevant to the situation we find ourselves in today, because as you say in the early chapters of your book, and then later in the closing chapters of of your book, the infrastructure we have influences the ways in which we live and that is really I think the the crooks of the matter today because here now we are in a world with a just in time supply chain we have such uh, we we have such thin skins and, and we have such immediate expectations we want it right now and when a technology is not ready right now we are just ready to turn to whatever is ready right now 
and it makes it so much harder to innovate. But these people back at this point in time, because they didn't have all that, everything was uphill for them. I would like you to uh, pick up with this narrative and talk about how electricity comes into this because that was a really tough transition and it sparked, no pun intended, a very serious debate because people really had to make hard choices about which way to go and that still came along before oil. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think one of the fascinating things about electricity is just, you know, we, uh, basically everyone alive today came about af- into a world in which electricity was just sort of a default. Like, if you were born after, you know, 1930, you probably don't remember any world before uh, before electricity. And yet it took, I mean, it literally took decades and decades before the vast majority of Americans had electricity. I mean, you're talking, you know, it's after, just after World War II, uh, World War II, just after the Civil War, excuse me, when you have, you know, electricity start to be produced and used and electric lamps and, you know, there's all these fascinating systems that have to get built in order for us to experience electricity the way that we do today. One, you know, interesting recent example is that early in the 20th century, as towns were trying to light themselves, you know, so not everyone has electricity in their homes, but, you know, towns on the plains just wanted to you know, have, say, the town square lit or just have any kind of electric light. They built these massive towers on which they placed just a few bright lights and they tried to, they tried to call them artificial moons as opposed to the kind of street light system them that we know now where you know just kind of regularly spaced poles of moderate height with one light on them and you know it sounds kind of silly to us now but people just didn't know exactly the best way that things were going to work out they didn't know which systems were going to be the most efficient which ones people were going to like and you see this in all kinds of ways i mean people didn't even know that electricity necessarily was going to be the, the way that we transmitted mechanical uh energy um there was another system at the time that was quite popular in europe and actually also in new york and philadelphia and other places that were basically compressed air tubes that sent power through the city. So if you were in Paris around the turn of the century, you could have used, you know, gotten compressed air right out of the wall like people do with electricity now. And that could have powered your sewing machines, that could have powered whatever kinds of things you might have had in your light industrial setting. And I think it's all those kinds of visions that get made that really kind of tie into our political realm, you know, when you try and think about how do those decisions get made that, that we would go with this thing or that thing. I think people assume that it's all sort of engineers driving that process. It's just the best way of doing things. It's the most efficient way of doing things. But I think it's not actually the case in a, in a lot of settings. Oftentimes, the way the infrastructure gets put in is shaped by the needs and wants of the of rich people, of people who run factories, and it's not necessarily to the benefit of of common people. And I think that that's you know something that gets left out of the discussion a lot because you would like to see, you know, a civics that can encompass these kind of technical systems and not, you know, go against what engineers say is possible or preferable, but come up with ways that benefit the most people and also, you know, kind of follow the dictates of the technology as well. Uh, That is the goal, but it has been a long time coming. And really, it's hard for any society to achieve that, I think, because it requires a high degree of education. It requires a high degree of knowledge, and it requires an ability to communicate. And I think really only here in the 21st century, now that we have a standardized school system and the Internet, that we are really starting to meet these requirements. And I can say that as a person who has probably a a different ideological point of view than you do. And when we look at really what a country needs for its energy policy, if people are honest about it and they get past their partisan thinking, we have more in common than we have differences. Oh, I totally agree with that. I I mean, you know, I think... uh, Great. There's some great examples of this, you know. I think, you know, if you look back, I think, you know, particularly around solar, I mean, if you look back before the kind of late 60s, where a kind of small percentage of solar advocates were, became very deeply associated with hippies and kind of countercultural movement, it became a kind of countercultural energy technology. Most of the people working on solar up to that point and after that point 
were not actually identified ideologically with the counterculture. It's one of the big points of the book that I hope came out of it, that a lot of people who've worked in this field were not uh, overly identified with any particular political position. I think you see a lot of people, particularly right after World War II, who are really excited about solar energy and nuclear energy, which is something that I think, you know, seems impossible to a lot of people now. But, you know, there are guys like Fairfield Osborne, who is a conservationist, a nuclear scientist, and was really into solar power. You know, I mean, it's like there are a lot of people like this around that time. And I think it's one of the sad things that that, that was lost, particularly around, you know, some of these powers. And in my particular view, both nuclear and solar power seem like they're going to be or should be a part of our energy picture in the future. And yet there's a vanishingly small number of people who believe that. (laughs) And I think that's something that I hope changes as, as time goes on. Now, speaking of change, I want to take a quick commercial break here and when we come back on the other side I want to talk to you about some of the things about the environmentalist movement that you've brought to light in this book that most people don't know about this program is brought to you by shadowfusionbooks.com One of the things that I was very much impressed with, especially in the early chapters of your book, was your description of the dichotomy in the early environmentalist movement. We don't stop to think that environmentalist, environmentalism, as we consider the concept, goes back to day one of this country, and you have the... The, the two major camps in the 19th century described as being on the one hand uh, the beliefs espoused by John Etzler and then on the other hand the preservationist beliefs of Thoreau as being the the, the goalposts, if you will. And I think if more people knew about that today, it would be a lot easier for them to understand what goes on inside the environmentalist movement because there really is a power struggle that goes on inside what we think of as environmentalism that makes it hard for the rest of us really to make heads or tails of what we see in the mainstream media. Yeah, and I, I mean, I you know I grew up in in Washington State during a time when you know kind of battles over the spotted owl and logging, a lot of those things were going on, and I think it's not like I think those things are unimportant, or you know, I mean, I, I'm happy people are trying to figure out what to what to do with land and big trees and things, but I also think that it's just for a lot of sort of my cohort of people who would consider ourselves environmentalists, that's just sort of secondary. I'm much more interested in transforming human systems than I am in preserving any particular like so-called natural systems, like any any particular ecological niche. And in fact, one of the things I've been suggesting for years is that part of a big bargain on climate policy, environmentalists could give up something like the Endangered Species Act, which I think is now based on kind of outdated version of how ecology works, trying to protect a few, a small number of very charming and known large animals at the, at the expense of either smart ecological policy in terms of trying to protect entire ecosystems or smarter development in terms of like trying to protect the entire planet by allowing certain types of development to go forward that might have other positive impacts. And I think, you know, those sorts of compromises are just like not on the table, I think, in the sort of still in the kind of mainstream uh, environmental movement. But I think they're definitely working their way in from the edges as people try and figure out, you know, what kind of movement do you need to rebuild the energy infrastructure of the world on a lower carbon basis, right? And I think the answer to that is one that's like much more pragmatic, one that has a lot more builders and engineers. I mean, just at a really basic level, you need people who want to build power plants and not stop them from getting built. And that's a really different kind of movement. And I think that's something that is still, yeah, like you said, it's still being worked out within the environmental movement. One strain of thinking, that kind of more thorough style thinking has been dominant for a long time, but I think that's changing. I think it's uh, likely to continue changing as people realize that both the science says there's not a ton of nature to be to, it's like there's not there's not a ton of nature that's natural as I would think it's probably a good way of putting it and also that the you know renewable energy development is quite land intensive relative to fossil fuels or nuclear power and so people who find themselves wanting renewable energy kind of have to be okay with some compromises on the land side and I think that 
is going to cause a lot of changes. One of the things that stands out to me is uh, the the civic nature of the thing. On the one hand, we're being fed a constant partisan argument when we should be having the civic argument. And as I look at the 19th century history, as you've got it laid out in this book, the two major camps, the, the developers versus the preservationists, were, at the very least, they were having the civic argument. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, and I think I, I think it's a good way of putting it, right? Because it, it kind of gets people back to their first principles a little bit. Like, what is it that we want to build about nature? You know, it, it, what what is it that we want to get out of development? And I think that partic- that particular kind of argument, you know, like trying to get people to think, not like, do I support Obama's policy or do I support Boehner's policy or something like that? That is going to trigger people to move into a partisan space. But I think if we ask some of these more basic questions about the values that people have. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time in the, in the national parks, particularly in Colorado. And one thing that has always blown my mind there is there is absolutely no political uh, uh, sorting mechanism at the nation's national parks, right? Everybody is there. Every kind of American you can imagine enjoys these places. And I think it's a, it's a question of saying, like, well, what is it that they enjoy and what about that is worth preserving? And how do we balance that against these other desires that people in society have? That conversation is something that I think a lot of, you know, just people are, are want to have because it's it's something that we can relate to. It doesn't say, you know, that you're a bad person if you, you know, want development in your area. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just says like, hey, there there may be good things about this, there may be bad, and what are these trade offs and, and balance points? And where can we get leverage on some of the big problems that are that are facing uh, the country and the world? I mean, not just climate change, which I think is the one we hear a lot about, but there's a lot of people without access to adequate energy resources. And for those people, you know, roughly a couple billion people, that is a really hard thing. I mean, they have no electricity, that causes all sorts of inefficiency, and it's really in their sort of daily lives, and it makes it very difficult for, for them to kind of come out of poverty. And I think, you know, it's those kinds of those kinds of problems. There, Those two things are linked, right? But most people don't care about both of them. <laughs> they care about one of them. And I think that's the kind of discussion that we could be having that, that would involve a lot more people in the sort of civic debate of that and not the sort of narrowly political one. I have said that politics and patriotism are two sides of the same civic coin and how you spend that currency does matter now no matter what you think of it because some people love it some people hate it but in the 19th century there was the concept of manifest destiny which you talk about in your book and as we get past World War II, a lot of that seems to go away. Now, today, we do not seem to have much in the way of a common national identity. There doesn't seem to be a common national future. So it seems to me that uh, that because that's missing, the central question would be, how would we come back to that so that we can have the civic argument and the seed for that I think is actually present in the the technical development of things because as you look at the timeline of the the technical progression that's present in your book, uh, all the, the newspapers, the philosophers, everybody's talking about the implications of all the new technologies that come along. Every time somebody develops something new that's a potential game changer, even if it's a flash in the pan or a scam and it doesn't work, it causes people to ponder the what ifs. And I think we could do ourselves a, a lot of good if we took a closer look at those what ifs. One of the problems of the, the way that you know, technical change gets debated is that you know, people marshal these kinds of reports that tell them, you know, this this is exactly what's going to happen. I mean, this this happened in the 1950s, the United States, particularly around power plant development. People started projecting out what they knew from uh, experience of the past few decades that electricity demand was going to continue to rise by 9% a year, basically forever. And it seemed like, you know, what we see now as a kind of argument that was encoded into a forecast seemed at the time just like, oh, it was just the numbers. It was just what was going to happen. 
And I think what you end up having is these kind of debates over various inevitabilities. I'm air quoting there because they're not actually inevitable, but that's how they're presented. And so people say, well, you know, even now we see it now. People say it's inevitable that the internet does X or Y, when really it's not inevitable that the internet does X or Y. And you can see that by how the internet has been implemented in a bunch of different countries, this network of networks. And the lesson for me out of all that is that the central question should always be debated in like a civic way and not around their, you know, the sort of supposed inevitable consequences of certain technical developments. And I think that to me is like the, the big lesson of the book, if there if there is one, that the engineers can't determine what it is that that are the right questions to ask about these technologies. That's something that lies in the social realm among people of all different political persuasions. Well, now, we've looked at this issue from a historical perspective, technologically, and now from a policy perspective. So I need to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back on the other side... I want to look at this now from a real world perspective because you've got a lot in your book to say about that, too. I'm Luke Herbert, and this program is supported by 3FeetRadio.com. Now, you spend a great deal of time near the end of your book talking about the Bright Source project that they have going down, going on down in Ivanpah, down there in, in, in the Mojave. And I've been following that for a number of years, and actually quite a few people here in Alaska have been following it. And there are quite a few parallels to that and the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. I don't want to over overly belabor the point, but so many of the battles that they are fighting in, in regards to that project, we are still fighting uh, with the, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline to include the, the notion that uh, the, the preservationists stepped forward and they said, if you do this pipeline, you will murder the caribou herds. And it turned out to be the exact opposite. And so as we watch the debate over that tiny little turtle down there uh, it's become something of a local joke and because yeah, yeah, sure. because we know that bright source is funded by pro develop uh, uh, environmentalists and it's heavily staffed by by people who are true ardent believers it uh, you know it it, ju- it just makes the whole thing just that much more bittersweet but i can think of nothing that more typifies your point so how do projects like that succeed in the future against that kind of headwind? I read through so many hundreds and thousands of pages of court filings for that chapter. Uh, not, I guess it's not court, but it's uh, you know these sort of uh, California Energy Commission hearings around that project. And it, I mean, it gets so ridiculous. Like it, there was there were several surveys done of how many desert tortoises there were. And every, you know, there was a guy who'd been counting desert tortoises for like 40 years for different projects there in the Mojave Desert. And suddenly, the second he goes and testifies for Bright Source that essentially there weren't that many desert tortoises, suddenly now that guy is like, has no idea what he's talking about. And all these different conservation groups brought in their own people. And, you know, there's these, there's literally these battles over how far the people's heads are turning as they walk a particular line looking for desert tortoise. Like, are they looking far enough around? I mean, it was, and you're just sort of like, can this really stop a project? I mean, to me, I think, I think for a lot of people who have, you know, environmental sympathies, I think it sort of was eye-opening, that particular case, because it just became clear, like, this wasn't about improving the project. This wasn't about actually really protecting a large amount of desert tortoises or a large amount of area out of the entire Mojave Desert, it was about stopping the project. And I think that's a key realization that, again, has to like sort of ripple through the environmental movement too, and it, when it turns on itself in this way. Those particular methods, and those are, again, are methods that were set up long ago uh, around the Endangered Species Act and various other types of legislation, those methods are just, they're annoying to people. 
people and they make enemies out of people who might otherwise be friends. And I think that has happened with hunters, that's happened with loggers, that's happened with all kinds of people who also, in fact, enjoy wilderness, who also, in fact, enjoy caribou herds and like the desert and all those sorts of things. But the methods that get employed and the kind of picky packness of the objections that just slow down these projects, increase their costs and do all these things, that is fundamentally not the civic kind of argument. It's it's a more, I don't even know what you call it. It's just, it's a, it's a red tape uh, kind of cheap trick, if you ask me, you know, and I think, I think that's tough. I mean, I think part of that is that's the way in the past we thought best way to legislate and adjudicate that kind of dispute was, and it's just not. And I think that's the kind of thing that needs to change, but it's very, it's difficult, you know. You're going to make a lot of friends here in Alaska when they hear those remarks because we often feel very heavily victimized by the armies of preservationist lawyers that descend upon us to litigate us into the ground to prevent us from doing a lot of things. And I think ultimately, now I have a background in history and political science, and the short version here is that history is not on their side. If the the first dozen or so chapters of your book prove anything, it's that just the human being will find a way, and if there's money to be made, then somebody's going to figure out how to do it. It may take a very long time for that technology to germinate, maturate, evolve, whatever it takes. But eventually there comes a day when it's marketable and there's going to be somebody out there to sell it. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that there's, you know, there's definitely something to be said for people, you know, debating these values, you know, out loud. But I also think that there is definitely, uh, you know, the the fact of the matter is there are a lot more people who would like to, you know, develop all sorts of different types of land than that want to preserve it. And I think it really is incumbent upon, you know, environmentalists to build a bigger tent if they want some of these things not to happen and not sort of try and win it on some, you know, BS technicalities, you know, and I think that's the, that's the thing that's sort of been lost. I think a lot of the sort of professionalized environmental movement went into doing, you know, fighting these really technical legal battles because that was the framework that got set up in the sort of deals that Richard Nixon made with the Democratic side of the aisle in the early 1970s around how environmental legislation was going to get passed. And I think a lot of those things are tough because some of those things work pretty well. I mean, Clean Water Act and stuff, you know, there are, there are very good things about that, some of that environmental legislation, stuff that we almost can't even remember because cities have gotten cleaned up. And I think, you know, one of the things that's fascinating to think about, though, is if that legislation hadn't gotten passed, right? And you can see why people end up believing deeply in it, right? Because if that legislation hadn't gotten passed, Los Angeles had air quality that was pretty comparable to what we see in China, right? I mean, even in like the early 1960s, which is kind of an, like when you really start to think about that, I think people sort of forget how far we've come. And to a certain extent, maybe that says two things. It says, you know, uh, to people who don't like the environmental movement, it says, well, you're also benefiting from it in a lot of ways. And to environmentalists, it might say, hey, you know, maybe these particular wins were the right wins and we don't have to keep pushing farther because we in fact have a level of air and water quality that most people feel is appropriate as a balanced policy proposition against economic development. And some of those things, that those, those memories, the, that history, I think um, can be used to sort of just balance people a little bit um, as opposed to pushing them off into further polarization. If we knew where we had been, we would have a better idea of where we can go. And with that in mind, as we go into the final few minutes of this program, since we've done a pretty good job here of explaining to everybody what the the differences are between the two camps, because this show is going to have some time capsule value. When this thing is uploaded to the internet, it will outlive both of us. And with that in mind, I want to ask two questions. The the first is, what do the green entrepreneurs need to do now 
to win the PR battle, to to shake off the uh, uh, the the to, to to shake off the hippie past of all these things, and to forge a new image that makes people want to endorse them, invest in them, and follow them into the future. And the reason I ask is that I've been around the aviation community my entire life, and every now and then again you go to an air show and you get a glimpse of something that will be mainstream in 20 years and that thing is championed by somebody who has to sell it really hard for the next 20 years. So how do the green technology entrepreneurs sell this over the next 20 years? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think, well, I mean, it kind of depends. I think there's sort of like a, a light road and a dark road here, right? I mean, I think the dark road is to, you know, push really heavily on some of the climate change's worst impacts, things like, you know, I I think that's been a way that people have done it. I think, you know, the other side of it, though, is to really push, I think, for kind of a suite of changes that uh, have other ancillary benefits for people that aren't just about, that aren't just about the technology in and of itself. I mean, because one of the things they have a very difficult time, particularly on the electricity side of things, is that if you plug into your electric, plug into your electric outlet, it's the same electricity, whether or not it was produced by, you know, a solar panel, a wind turbine, you know, natural gas, you know, combined cycle plan or any of those things, right? I mean, it's all, it all feels the same to you. And so I think, you know, trying to change this commodity out, right? And I think that's a really tough sell. And so I think a big part of it has to be building the systems around these things. So some of that is, you know, supporting things that have broad bipartisan support to like around smart grid type things that could uh, make it easier easier to incorporate more wind and solar into the system. I also think it's as, you know, presenting just as like part of the solution to some of our economic problems. I mean, not all of them, obviously, but there is something to be said for developing a domestic industry that is going to be selling a lot of these things over the next, you know, 100 years to many different parts of the world. And I think they've kind of got a nice tailwind because the price of solar panels continue to drop and have been dropping for about 50 years at a fairly consistent rate as the industry has scaled up. You know, with that at their backs, it's not going to be that hard in the lower part of the lower 48 to convince a lot of people to go solar over the next, you know, 20 years because the fact of the matter is because of the way that the grid works, because of the way the transmission and distribution of electricity work, for rooftop solar systems in the very near future, it's just, it's going to be kind of a no-brainer if you have the capital to invest up front. And it, already in a lot of parts of California and Arizona, it's a pretty decent deal. I mean, your payback time is a few years and then you're saving money for years after that. And I think that type of argument is pretty easy to make, even for people who don't care that much about any of the environmental reasons that you might want to use solar panels. And on the very last question, for the sake of future generations who will listen to this 50 and 100 years from now, what would you like to tell them about this period in which they, in which you and I currently live? What have we done right? What have we done wrong? Well, I think... What we've done wrong is sort of obvious. I think, you know, we in this country for the last 50 years have never really actually come up with an energy policy that has been consistent and provided the right kinds of goalposts and the right kinds of constraints for people. The example I always give for any football fans out there is like we tried to develop an energy policy like the Raiders, Al Davis, tried to build a football team. You know, you just sign the latest, hottest thing and pour a bunch of money into it. And I think the reality reality is our most successful energy programs have been things that have gone on for a really long time with consistent money flowing into them. I mean, a great example of this is the Natural Gas Research Institute, which has opened up lots of natural gas resources and that was funded on a consistent, steady basis for decades. And I think that type of thing is what we've done wrong and right, you know, when we've provided, you know, consistent, steady support to energy technologies, they've worked out. And when we haven't, sometimes they've worked out, but almost the 
despite ourselves. <laughs> and I think one of the things that we've done amazingly well in the United States is to create new things, come up with new uh, innovations. I mean, it's something that we really do, even now, better than any other country in the world. I and mean, sadly, some of them, say like solar hot water, we've just given over leadership of that to other countries. I mean, there, I mean, there are literally millions and millions of solar hot water heaters in China, none of them made in the United States. And that was an industry that we created and perfected uh, in the 20th century here in this country. And I think when we look back, I think that we probably will say to ourselves, you know, we, we could have done more to support these energy technologies. On the other hand, I, I guess maybe I'm nice to people of, uh, of history because I sort of feel like one of the reasons we didn't do more is there's been a lot of other things going on. <laughs> You know, and I think I think when people look at this time period, they'll say like, wow, well, you know, they didn't do all they could have. Then again, you know, they were distracted by lots of things that were also important to many citizens in the country. And there you have it. History, technology, and policy all in one episode. I'd like to point out for Mayor Bloomberg's benefit that we did all of this without any trans fats and in less than 16 ounces. So if you like what you heard in this episode, please feel free to find us online at politicsandpatriotism.com. Have a look at our show blog where you can read book reviews and click on links to past shows with other authors. From the main page, you can also subscribe to our RSS feed, which will allow you to download all of our past episodes for free, or you can go to the iTunes store and download all of our past episodes for free. Or you can click on the player that's right there on the front page and listen to our shows without having to download anything. You could, of course, make us all very happy by going to Stitcher.com, and thanks to the very nice people at Stitcher Smart Radio Network, you can download any of their free apps, because they've got them for your Apple smartphone, your Android device, or for your tablet. And all of these things will allow you to listen to us anywhere on this green earth. So on behalf of everyone here at the show, thank you for your time and have a good day.